you hit so many kind of hot buttons for what we try to do at Future Frogmen that uh, I, I couldn't have scripted it any better. <laughs> um, just say yes is uh, ties really in with our, our theme of exploration, uh, getting into the field and experiencing the field on top of the, uh, the classroom and the laboratory. Mm -hmm. So that's a wonderful message, You're willing to uh, share your personal uh, journey. Um, that it wasn't a straight path and uh, the hurdles you uh, you went through. I think that's really uh, admirable and, and really uh, uh, helpful to uh, to those that are listening today as well as those that will listen to this in the future. Uh, and if we if we talk about the turtles for a minute, a um, couple co comments there. Um, how do you feel about this? Ashley called it a pandemic. Are, are you worried? You know, I'm, I'm worried to the extent that I think it's possible that this condition has been existing, you know, alongside sea turtles for a very long time. The part that worries me is that the new aspect of the challenges that sea turtles face is what humans bring to the equation and what might have been in a disease that did quite any sea turtle out be exacerbated by all sorts of human um, contact or the pollution of coastal systems or even just interference with reproduction efforts at nesting beaches. So I'm encouraged by the fact that we do see the tumors recede, um, but part of my dissertation will also hopefully be to understand the relative importance of, you know, the immune genes that the turtles have and if there are any particular populations that are particularly vulnerable to FP um, for any reason. And uh, hopefully we can identify those because it isn't something that, you know, sits well with me, um, especially that we are in the age of this rise of wildlife infectious diseases like, you know, BD and chytridiomycosis in frogs or Tasmanian devil facial tumor disease in Tasmanian devils. It's, you know, not something that makes me happy um, and it is worrying. Uh, absolutely. I mean, when you when you think about it, um, it, FP might not kill all individuals, but if it's that situation of here you have these endangered species, and here's yet something else exactly that's affecting them and is going to endanger their their future prospects. So yeah, I I, I hear you. Katie, I imagine it it it's outside the scope of your specific study, but are you aware of studies going on that may be looking at uh, coastal pollution uh, of various types, for example, what jumps to mind might be sewage uh, and or possibly even something like nuclear waste uh, runoff? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there is, interestingly, at UCF, there's been um, a big initiative for these cluster departments um, where people are hired in clusters. And one of them um, that's pretty new is this UCF Coastal. And I think it's going to be combining environmental engineers and biologists and biogeochemists to better understand things exactly like that. I mean, especially in Florida, we've had runoff from Lake Okeechobee and red tide. And I mean, the, the field site, the study site, the Indian River Lagoon where we work, um, in October of last year, we were out on the boats and as humans, we were feeling the effects of red tide. Um, and, you know, we know that's exactly the you know, pollutants being in the system. Um, so I think that is kind of the next step is to kind of synthesize, you know, what we know from the biology of the organisms that call these places home, but then taking it a step further and understanding the actual players in the environment to better understand disease and, and the stressors these animals face. Yeah. What about, um, do you have any evidence or theory about whether these turtles are feeling any pain? That's a great question. Um, you know, it's hard, it's hard to tell and I never want to overly anthropomorphize an animal. Um, but I mean, at the same time, these turtles are absolutely capable of feeling pain, um, but they're also so incredibly resilient. Um, we have seen nesting females come up, come up on the beach where they're missing a good portion of their flipper, probably from a shark bite um, or shark attack, or even things like boat propeller strikes, and they're still pushing. Um, so they're incredibly hardy. Um, I think these tumors are probably really sensitive. They are highly vascularized, so it probably makes sense that they're probably 
highly innervated as well. Um, and so I think these tumors are far from pleasant, um, especially when they get to be really big and bulbous. Um, these turtles just get really slowed down by them. Um, yeah. Yeah. One, one last question I have would be related to, you just mentioned bulbous, whether, whether the tumors are treatable and if anybody is treating them, you know, yeah. uh, taking them off the turtle and then releasing the turtle. Yeah, that's a great question. So there are several rehab facilities, um, whether associated with zoos or their own societies in Florida. Um, I believe there was a study that came out that human, human chemotherapy drugs were actually effective on these papillomas on turtles. Um, but more often than not, when a turtle is brought into rehab, um, I think there have been some studies showing that laser removal of the tumors is helpful, although it doesn't uh, rule out the regrowth of those tumors at that same site. But generally when a turtle is brought into rehab, you know, all of a sudden it doesn't have to keep itself afloat in the water column. It's getting regular food, the water is clean, and we do tend to see a recession of those tumors during that time. But again, is that because the water is clean or is it just because they're being well fed and they don't, you know, have to deal with the stressors of other things involved in living in the wild. Um, but that happens pretty regularly. If we encounter turtles um, that are at a particular level on the fibropapilloma scale, they are immediately sent to rehab and then they are usually released, which is good. Okay, I see we have a question from uh, Teresa and uh, she put it in the chat, so I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, so the audience can hear. Can you talk a little more about how you found your lab, your labs at Stony Brook and at UCF, how you knew they would be a good fit for you? That's a great question. And one that caused me a lot of, you know, existential dread when I was considering applying to grad schools, because it's, it's a big choice. Um, basically, you know, when you begin the process of applying to grad schools, a lot of professors now have websites or even Twitter accounts where you can kind of see what they're doing for research. Um, and you have to ask yourself the question, you know, are you wanting to be faithful to a study species or are you more interested in broader questions that can be asked using really any species study evolution? Yeah. But I also had, you know, an affinity for sea turtles, partly because of the work I had already put into understanding their biology. Um, and so for me, I fell into a really awesome opportunity here at UCF where I could do both. But, you know, that's not always the case. So you should ask yourself, are you more interested in working with the sea turtles? Are you more interested in working with the disease ecology, just as an example? Um, and once you begin the process of reaching out to professors to see if they have funding and openings for you in the lab, um, always make sure to talk to people that are in the laboratory as well. Um, I think one piece of advice that I saw on Twitter is when you ask a grad student how they're doing, you want them to be miserable or unhappy because their experiments aren't going the way they wanted, not because of their relationship with their lab mates or with their advisor. And I mean, that's just, that's true of anywhere. Um, so it's really worth it to have a very frank conversation, I think, with your potential advisor about, this is the type of mentee I am. This is the type of management that I do well under. You know, do you like being micromanaged or do you like to be more independent? There's no right or wrong answer to any of these things, but there absolutely is such a thing as right and wrong fits. Um, and one thing that's really encouraging that I'll say is kind of a final note on this is that science Twitter is alive and well, and there are a lot of really awesome contacts you can make there. People post about opportunities. You can get bite-sized information about the type of research they're doing. And it's a really good window into seeing what kind of a person um, a PI is or even the students that are in their lab. Have you noticed uh, with FP or through your, through your research, is FP present in, in other groupings of animals and other taxa? And if so, uh, are, are you sharing data with other groups of scientists? That's a really good question. Um, so this particular, you know, um, type, we are only seeing in, tur in sea turtles, but there are also lots of other types of herpes viruses that attack, um, that attack other taxa. I mean, gopher tortoises come to mind. I mean, I think they have like this upper respiratory disease that they can get as well as some herpes viruses that have been implicated in certain diseases. Um, so, I mean, as of yet, you know, there isn't, I wouldn't say a lot of synthesis between groups that study vastly different taxa, but you know, you bring up a good point that it could be really beneficial um, to do that. I mean, especially because 
turtle, sea turtles being protected and endangered, there's not a whole lot that we can do experimentally with them, you know, and the protections are in place for a reason. But because of that, there are certain studies that are just off limits, which instead of in sea turtles, maybe we could study in, you know, related taxa that aren't as endangered um, or maybe are even invasive in a certain range. Um, so I think that would be really interesting going forward to kind of get a consortium of, you know, various herpes virus related disease pathologies. Absolutely. Uh, Katie and Ashley, outstanding job. Thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. Thank you for watching the Future Frogmen conversation series. Please check out our website at www.futurefrogmen.org.